This is a Change Physician episode 213. Welcome back to the Change Physician. I am Melissa Cady, the Challenge Doctor, with my co-host, Dr. Kevin Kakaro. How are you? I am well. How are you doing? I'm good. We we were debating about uh, some of these topics. Uh, we can go all over the place, I guess, because we have a lot of thoughts on things. Well, not um, not only a lot of thoughts, but um, in this particular one, there's some probably some controversial and there's a potential for hurt feelings, I think. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah because what we were gonna know yeah maybe well maybe i don't know um well actually that's probably entirely possible but we were gonna talk about like how healthcare is out of control yeah you know and um and specifically like the money and craziness that's associated with healthcare Mm -hmm. yeah and this is going to be a little bit counter i guess we just said okay well did you ever go through medicine again yeah absolutely we just an episode not too long ago on uh, whether or not you would want to do medicine and there's and and it's interesting, actually, looking back, is none of the reasons that we gave was money. They were all had about autonomy, control, awareness, knowledge, et cetera. Um, the money in healthcare, did, should physicians be paid? Absolutely. But healthcare costs are so insane. Mm-hmm. And we were just looking at some advertised rates for people, whoever, <laughs> clinicians in healthcare. So they're not all physicians or whatever. Extenders, and, yeah. And it is, it's absolutely insane. And I'm, I'm not one to say, um, you know, there's this big thing, physicians know your worth and don't make less. And, and I do think that's true. When you have somebody else who doesn't have a physician's training and they're making a crap ton more, or they're being paid more, or they have better life, work-life balance plus more money than you, Mm -hmm. um, I have a huge problem with that. That is, that's, um, and that has to do with, actually, I'm not even sure what it has to do with economics. I'm not, doesn't make any sense, but, um, but there's this, there's a lot of belly aching. <laughs> Let me just say, there's a lot of belly aching in healthcare about, oh, we don't make enough money as physicians. And we make a lot of money in clinical practice, mm-hmm. whoever you are. I'm not saying your training is, is not difficult. We've talked about that. I'm not training that you're not worth it. I'm, uh, you, you are, but what I am saying is that money is not grown on trees. Healthcare dollars are a limited resource Mm -hmm. and healthcare, including physicians have been very, very poor stewards of the money in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So people like to say, well, there's administrative bloat. There's absolutely positively administrative bloat in hospitals without a doubt. I've seen two hospitals now where I've looked at their financial data um, that all of a sudden they said they were in the black. And then when you actually went to where they were in the black to when they weren't in the black, the differences Mm -hmm. was this was this massive increase in administrative salaries. I mean, it was shocking. Okay, so we know administrative bloat is there. But as physicians, we also contribute to this when we order unnecessary things, do unnecessary things, Mm -hmm. schedule things for people for unnecessary things, and, and, and continue to do them over and over again, despite the data. Right. Um. A high, I'm going to blatantly say it. There's a lot of high priced specialties who make a crap ton of money. And the way they make their money is to do things that are not medically indicated based on the data that's out there. Right. And, and I, so I have a hard time when people are saying, oh, we need to make more money. Why are you making more money? Because if you look from like the entrepreneurship lens, entrepreneurs are supposedly creating value for which they get paid Mm -hmm. except in healthcare. We don't get care. We don't get paid for the value we create. We get paid for the things that we do. Procedure driven. Uh Procedure driven. And and it's now going into these infusion centers and all these fancy new drugs. And there's certain specialties that can, you know, start all that stuff. And, um, and they do it. (laughs) <laughs> and then they, and then people have the, have, have the gall to say that the, the financial incentive doesn't change their judgment, which is, that just makes me, that, I just lose it right there because it's like, okay, that's a total like opinion you have that is based on nothing because it's totally incongruent with all the literature that has to deal with how we process information. And to say that it doesn't affect you is a, you're either ignorant, you don't know it, or you're lying, period. That's all there is. Um, and so Can I give an it, example? Uh, about you uh, your thought? an example of that actually happening. Well, I don't want to go out names because I don't want to get, I no, don't want, not, they have a lot more money than me. 
in, in, no, they, no, in, in, in their litigious. But I've seen this. I literally saw somebody in our particular specialty realm in pain who said that they who, who really fought hard about how they didn't believe that pharmaceutical money or the fact that they got paid for things other than what they did influenced their clinical judgment, despite all the nonsense crap that they're still publishing online. Yeah. And this person owned and sold a pharmaceutical marketing research company for several million dollars. Yeah. Either you are ignorant or you're lying, period. Yeah. Um, Can I give another example personally? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I'll let you uh, <laughs> decompress. <laughs> there is a person I know that I'm not going to say it's somebody who does surgery and they went from personal private practice to salaried. Oh. And the number of cases that they went to was precipitate, precipitously less. So it was not stating they needed surgery as often um, because there's no incentive. They get paid the same whether they do 10 surgeries or two surgeries. And it just, the number, like one of these number one biases we have, I'm not gonna say it's number one, but it's a very strong bias is that what you do and how you influence patients can be directly related to what you make from what you do to them. So, and if it's not, if it's not connected, it's been disconnected on how much you do to the patients and you'll still make the same amount of money. Well, you just sit and talk to your patients and you know, if it's really an emergency, you'll take care of it. But if it's not really necessary, you're not going to push it. And, and that's the kicker, right? Because people are saying, well, oh, capitated models or you're salaried. And so they're denying care. Oh, they wouldn't do this because this guy in the private practice would do it to me. No. <laughs> Physicians, if, if there was something that absolutely positively needed to be done, they would do it. Yeah. Be for multiple different reasons. Number one, we would hope because it's the right thing to do. Number right. two, because they would be scared of the, of the lawsuit that's associated with it. Right. But, but doing, but it, so that's, that's the thing that just it kills me off. And I, um, and so I, I have these debates and I'm, I'm sure someone's going to be mad at me, like whether or not we should all be capitated or whether or not we should be in a, in a single source healthcare system, which I'm actually for, I like more of the two tiered thing where you have a baseline. And if you want to jump the queue and get private health insurance, like some of the other countries, then fine, do it. But the fact of the matter is there's a lot of people doing things that they shouldn't be doing and getting a lot of money for it. And do I think they need more money? No. In fact, I, I, I think it's completely inappropriate. Now for, for a person who's not a physician, if I haven't pissed everybody off yet, <laughs> like one of, one of the things that you need to recognize is people are incentivized to, to do things to you in medicine. So then you're like, well, how do I, who, who have not, you know, I don't have any medical training. How do I survive the system? And that, the, the number one way, in my opinion, and there's actually some facts to back this up, because some of the studies that actually, when you're looking at less invasive versus more invasive care, is if you have people, I, I call it the difference between could care and should care. Mm -hmm. And if you go in and see whoever, a specialist, and they're like, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this. And you're like, well, I don't really want it. And they say, well, okay, but we could do it. You probably don't need it, really. <laughs> it's when they think we should do it. We need to do this. We got to do this. And you say no. And they say, and then they want you to sign a form that says this is against medical advice. In that situation, it's probably warranted. Um, I have seen that has been abused once, at least in, that I've seen. But in if general, that's a, do that. <laughs> if it's a, it's do a, that to you. <laughs> yeah, but it's a very safe bet. If in, in, in the other, if, if multiple people are saying it shouldn't be done, and then one person says yes, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean they're a good person. <laughs> I mean, that's the default. People are like, oh, there's one doctor over here. Everybody else said no, but this one person said, so they're the greatest thing in the world. No, that does not mean that they're a good physician. It means that they fit your biases and they're providing care that has a good chance not to be what the standard is. Right. And if you're, if a, if you're being, being, being referred for an elective surgery, who people are already incentivized to do, and you have a surgeon says no, and you have another surgeon says no, and you have another surgeon says no, I can virtually tell you 99.999999% of the time that is surgery that absolutely positively hasn't been done because they're all looking for a reason to operate. And the fact that they don't, that, that to me is like, okay, I'm done. I don't have to go back. But it's, uh, 
So, th- so this is a long way to say is like, hey, yeah, there's a lot of money in healthcare. A lot of that money is being thrown at things that are ineffective, that are not based on evidence. We have extraordinarily highly paid specialists who have fantastic training, but make their money by doing stuff that's not meant to be done on people, um, in addition to the people it needs to be done on, but they're not differentiating between the two anymore. We have a culture that fosters this idea that somehow the outlier is good and the other people are bad. And if you have a capitated model that somehow that gives you insufficient care because obviously everything needs to be done rather than, hey, you know, only do things that are when they're appropriate. And, and, and it's completely unsustainable on every single end. Um, it's not just, you know, administrative costs. I will always argue, yes, we pay too much administrators, but yeah. you got to be able to look at yourself and see what you do. Yeah. And, and we all contribute to this. You know, if you say nothing, you're contributing to, I mean, the, the, I think I use this in one of the other episodes, you know, the, the Talib quote of, if you see fraud and you don't say fraud, then you're a fraud. We have a <laughs> lot of frauds in medicine. Complicit. Complicit. Um, yeah, I, I, I just thought about another uh, situation of, uh, you know, um, you can see how crazy things are in this medical system. When you look at some academic spine surgeons that don't do fusions, they, they're like, no, you don't need a fusion. Uh, that, that's not indicated. But then you got a million, like not million, but tons of private spine surgeons presenting all the latest and greatest new devices and things and, you know, saying, you need, oh, you're, you know, you need this fused and from like L1 to S, you know, S1, you know, crazy, you know, just crazy stuff. And these aren't like trauma patients. These are like walk in almost, you know, maybe not walking great, but just hurting, you know? And uh, anyway, when you have such a drastic assessment <laughs> between an academic salary surgeon versus someone who's in private, um, industry, um, just makes you scratch your head and think, okay, there's something really a big disconnect and disconnect from science, uh, partially, <laughs> um, you have a thought. Well, I, I was just going to say, and this thing that frustrates me, cause there's a lot of people who say that they're capitalists and they're not capitalists, they're cronyists and they're vultures. True capitalism is based on value creation. When you are extracting value, <clears throat> and not improving the overall benefit. Like, so we're not, we're not increasing value. You're extracting value from the system and you're extracting value from people's lives. That's a vulture. Mm-hmm. And so, so this, you know, there, there's, I mean, that's a, there's so, so many of these, so many, I guess I'm, there's everybody, but there's some people that are just like so blatant about like everything is so money driven and they're like, oh, anti this and they don't want a single pair and they hate all this stuff. But man, if we had a system where you couldn't get paid, but you, you had to be cash and people had to be paid, you know, they paid you directly. So we didn't have this insurance garbage stuff kind of going around. It was directly between you and whoever the, the clinician was, your income would fall because you'd have to start producing value and you're not producing it. Yeah. And yeah. so don't call me, you're not, you're not a capitalist. You're, you're, you're a freaking vulture. So yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not anti-capitalist. I'm not like rampant capitalist, but I am definitely not anti-capitalist. I am into value creation, do things that provide value, make the things better. And that's what you should get paid for. If you can yeah. produce a lot of value, you, then make a billion dollars. Uh, but if you're extracting it and you're making people worse and you're yeah. taking money because of this insurance pool from everybody else who puts it in and driving up premiums for everybody else, because, and you're getting paid whatever excess amount of money because you're over-utilizing, you're doing too much, you suck, period. <laughs> well, you know, I have, I'm going to have to do some like um, self uh, check here on, you know, myself. You know, I have 85% cash patients. I am trying to create a value beyond what's being offered out there in the anesthesia world, which takes more time from me, um, which probably decreases really what I'm getting paid per hour if you want to break it down to hours or something. But there's also the, the, the twist there that, do people really need any of these things? Um, you could probably just debate and say no, but it's their own money, a direct, you know, direct payment for most of these people for what, you know, what they perceive as important or potentially life-changing in their eyes, even though, you know, it, it may not be warranted in other people's eyes. Um, and so there's that question mark, like, you know, like, 
someone's going to be there doing the anesthesia. Yeah, I can make that rationalization. Yeah, that's a, that's a common one for almost all clinicians. Right. Even for surgeons, I, I remember getting in, in, into a, uh, a a little dis- discussion. It wasn't quite frank argument with an anesthesia friend of mine because we were talking about value based care or whatever. And he goes, "Yeah, one of my orthopedic friends. He said um, someone such such comes over this operation. And the question is, you do it or not? Uh, it doesn't really seem to be educated, but maybe they got a lot. Maybe it's like a a knee arthroscopy, which there's not a lot of data for, or the data that we have says you shouldn't be getting them for minimal or mild uh, OA. Lots of arthroscopy still being done, despite the data showing that if you don't have an operation, you actually do better. So anyway, um, my friend said, I told him, yeah, when you, you don't do the surgery and this friend who's in, who's the surgeon said, no, you're, that's the wrong answer. Because if you don't do it, the guy down the street's going to do it. And, and then you see, we see this all the time in medicine. It's like, if I don't do this operation, then that hack down the street is going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That's such yeah. self-justification. Like they're, they're trying to do this dissonance between I'm doing something that's not appropriate and I'm a good physician. And so they're doing the self-justification activity mm-hmm. involved with it. Um, now in your specific situation, anesthesia, we have a hard boat, man. Yeah, because you accept what comes to you. you and so I and so I'm I'm trying to, and this is probably self-justification as well. But in anesthesia, our job, our our job is the person in front of us. Yeah. We do not have control over what they're scheduled for. We don't have con- control over what surgeries are being done. What we do have control is to do the best anesthetic for the person in front of us every single time. Right. Period. Uh, now, outside of anesthesia sphere, you can talk to people all you want and say, you know, do you really need that operation? I, I do think in cash, cash changes the situation for cash-based things such as plastics. Now there's a big debate. Do you actually need a nose lift or not a nose lift or a brow lift or whatever? Yeah. That ultimately is up to the individual. Right. So, so th- there are some specialties where I, I'm like, that's cash. And as long as people have a frank discussion and do or, and are trying to do the best that they possibly can, that makes sense. The problem is, is all the stuff that's getting done for a pain, you know, pain yeah. or uh, some other thing or, you know, stents for, for angina without cardiovascular, you know, without uh, coronary artery disease, like all, all of this stuff that is being done and people just do and do and do and do without creating value mm-hmm. and extract and, and, and then it, because we're all paying for it. Mm-hmm. The, the individual that you've harmed by doing this stuff is paying for it. Everybody else in the system is paying for it because we have the higher premiums. Like, don't complain about higher insurance premiums as a physician if you're the ones involved with this. Like, don't, because you're you're doing that. And um, man, it just it just it it just it, I don't understand how people are so can be so focused on just extracting, like pulling everything they can without recognizing the harm that they do to everybody else around them. Yeah. It, it uh, and in medicine, it's, it's, it really is sad. Like, cause we are not supposed to be doing that and we do it like, um, and, and we're not alone. I mean, there's every single industry. I mean, you look at financial services and it's there you look at, we've, you know, we talked about the trades, there's trades that are really good marketers that do crappy jobs. Um, car mechanics, if, you know, there's car mechanics that tell you a bunch of stuff are really nice maybe. And they may have a nice setup in their, coffee room or whatever, because they know you're going to see them all the time because they're not going to fix what you need to be fixed. <laughs> but man, can we this is focus on value creation, doing the right thing for the right reasons to provide value to the person. So there's a value that equation is correct. Yeah. Where we are getting paid for the value that we create, not getting paid for the value that we take away. Yeah. Well, you know, you, you speak of value, I think maybe the shift to, you know, how crazy medicine has become or where we're at now and post well on the tail end i would still say we're in the pandemic um but it's just not as uh new and it's still still obviously we just recently got it so obviously it's still going around and it's going to be endemic so um you know to a certain extent whatever variant but supply and demand um is a big issue i think uh, obviously we have supply chain issues when it comes to medications um, and that could be related to workforce. It can be re- other things, but, you know, we're looking at some of these prices at, you know, mid levels or physician extenders or, or whatnot are, are asking for demanding, 
um, because the supply isn't there, whether it's people that decided to retire, I know there's been quite a few people that left medicine because of the pandemic and issues around that and burnout and <clears throat> multiple other features, but because the supply is lower and we were already at a problem, you know, with get, having enough people for physicians or other um, providers to help people, even mental health is a huge issue, uh, which has become very, uh, I think we have more awareness of, uh, you know, social isolation and, and the anxiety and depression and other things that can go along with it. But the demand and the price, I mean, this all links to everything you just talked about with premiums too. We have a higher demand when it, our supply is low, demand for higher, um, first of all, to fill the positions. And because they're so desperate, they're paying more. And so now all these, these providers are expecting more how that's going to fall back down, I don't know, but yeah, it's, it it's, is, hard to, it, it's hard to pay people less. Yeah, it's a snowball effect. Yeah. And we're going to have to deal with this, not just with an inflationary issue, the, the lack of supply of providers and the ones that are going to work are going to require more pay. This is all coming out of our pockets in some way or another. And so it's, um, I, I don't have the, the solution for it, but I think we have to realize that this this is going to be a, a snowball um, that might get even more out of control. Well, and 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 because we haven't fixed fixed or addressed the issues that propagate this entire this huge need for demand, we're a fat, sick, unhealthy uh, country. Period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and th so, like a lot of the a lot of the major problems that we are facing in the country now. And people are, you know, so we got the healthcare situation, we've got um, the homeless situation, and, and certainly in, in my state and most, most other big cities and things, uh, we have the mental health issues. These are, these are not things that just happened overnight, and they're not something that happened with the pandemic. The pandemic simply showed, increased the cracks in the system that were already in place. Yeah. But these were problems that have been created for the last 40 years, yeah. 40 years of policy where we haven't addressed this stuff. Yeah. And if we have, you know, healthcare is a big one. When you have direct healthcare being 5% of the overall kind of, when you're looking at the whole system, and yet we consume like 90, 95% of the healthcare dollars, and we're so reactionary, that's a problem. We haven't done anything to address that. Yeah. We haven't done anything to address upstream health. Um, we haven't done anything to be promoting physical activity, or I shouldn't say anything, but we haven't done it in such a way that we actually systemized it so that we're decreasing downstream effects. We're, we're early childhood intervention, physical education in schools, mental health awareness, and really resiliency. Cause I don't, I don't like the idea of awareness where people then start saying, I'm anxious and they blame everything on anxiety and, and they use it as an excuse rather than an explanation and try to overcome. I'm not saying that there isn't crippling anxiety. There is. Um, but like all this stuff, there is a baseline of utility to it. And if you just feed into it saying this is pathological, you actually make it worse. And, and, and what's funny is all these fixes, mm -hmm. and it makes me want to stab myself in the eye because I don't like saying things that are not within your own circle of control. But a lot of the fixes that we need to actually improve the healthcare system where we actually address the supply demand issue are things that are outside of the healthcare system, stable housing stable neighborhoods, stable parenting, stable environments. That are things that we need to actually keep people healthy mm -hmm. and healthy people um, and not encourage people to go to the doctor all the time for everything. Like yeah. the magic thing that somehow we can fix everything. We can't, I mean, there's so little like I. Improve I just, all zip codes. Cause apparently that's related to your health. <laughs> it's a huge factor with your health. Yeah. Huge, yeah. huge you factor where you live. Yeah. No. We don't have a direct control over that, right? So, but the things that we can control is making sure we're doing things appropriately. We're doing things that are based on evidence. We're practicing. If we're using anecdote, it's based on evidence, not in spite of evidence. Um, we do the right thing because it's the right thing, not because I get paid to do it. Yeah. Uh, and then on a broader scale is really recognizing that these healthcare needs are not necessarily deficiencies in um, motivation or what's the other one people use? uh, values that somehow, you know, homeless people are homeless because they want to be homeless and they're lazy do-gooders or whatever, without recognizing the trauma that they've been in, the environments that they're in, the lack of positive role models that they've had, the lack of education that they've been able to receive because maybe they were in a place that didn't have it. You know, all this stuff that we tend to, we kind of blame on these individuals, which are actually societal problems, um, at least in part, 
you know, it, be aware of those, you know, is a, is a physician, like my favorite definition is a physician and teacher, right? Mm -hmm. Teacher, uh, uh, or not, the, I got that backwards. Doctor from Docare okay. used to teach, Yeah. right? And physician, and there's a couple different different definitions. I like the one I kind of use to heal, right? So ideally what we are is healers and teachers, teaching how people to get healthy and healing people, not harming them through doing a bunch of stuff. All right. Well, if we could have that truly resonate <clears throat> within every single person that's trying to or it's part of the medical system, we'd be in a better place. But um, there's bias and money and all these things that- uh, And it's hard. To do the right thing is hard. It's a lot of work. Right. It's draining too sometimes. It's extraordinarily draining. When you're incentivized to do not the right thing, it's even harder. And you know what's hard when it's the drain? It's You have to put in the time to talk to patients, to help them understand. You know, the worst thing is like they come- they think you are not giving them what they need or want. And it's really what they think they need, but it's not really what they need. Um, and, and the, and that, the hard that's part, where it can be disheartening. It, and it can, right? And, and that's, an, that's, that's this interpersonal dynamic that we have. Yeah. And, and here's the tough thing, and it's probably going to be really tough for, for people who are non-medical to hear. Histories are incredibly important, but if you have a long history and it's the same thing that you keep coming into, 90 plus percent of that information is going to be in the chart. Um, if you've read the chart, like I did a lot of, I would pre-read on my patients a lot, take a lot of extra time, read all this stuff. And, and the narratives that you could find, it, usually when you're meeting someone, you kind of just find out some instant details, but most of the time you kind of knew what was happening. And if you're in an emergency situation, a lot of times it's even faster, right? So they don't, you can look all this data that you may not be getting directly from this person. You don't know what they're doing when they're not facing you directly. Mm -hmm. And, and that doesn't mean they're providing bad care. It means you just are not aware of the care that they're giving you. So it's, it's tough though, because we want touchy feely. We want, you know, whatever the movie doctor or the TV show doctor that's in the room the whole times. And you have the, you know, the, the medical student that's been a medical student for four years in the ER. That's the one always made me laugh. Um, but, but that face-to-face -face contact doesn't necessarily mean that that care is better. And like you probably, just, 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 just the fact because you like someone doesn't mean that they're providing you the best care. Right. These are just providing the care that you want. Yeah. Well, and you might just enjoy the interaction or the socialization aspect to it too, regardless of. Well, and you don't want an asshole. I mean, that's, right. that's the other thing is like, no one wants to feel like crap. Because... No, no. But I would, I, I mean, having, I mean, we, when we talk, we refer back to the episode on, on being happy that we went through medical school and residency and all that stuff is um, I knew there, there was a couple of surgeons. I knew there were not the most pleasant people to be around, mm -hmm. but they were damn good surgeons. And yeah. I've met some people that presented very pleasantly, at least initially until things started going wrong and then they couldn't handle anything yeah. that were just absolutely atrocious like yeah. atrocious surgery. Now the golden is also, you want a nice person who's respectful and well, is competent. Well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but if you only have to pick one, pick the competent for sure. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, it depends what it is you're going in there for too. Like if they're going to do things to you, not just give advice, but do things to you um, when you're completely unconscious, <laughs> you definitely want the confident one, especially in an emergency situation uh, where you don't have a chance to get a second opinion. It's now or never. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, um, I think that I don't, I don't want us to seem very pessimistic, but I think we have to be pragmatic and realistic about the state we're in right now when it comes to the medical system. Um, you know, and you brought up creating value. I think people are going to become more aware of that. And I think the reason people are going to become more aware of it is because more money is coming out of their own personal pockets from a premium deductible, um, all of that adding up because people may not even get close to meeting that deductible and they feel like they're just paying cash anyway. So I feel like we're on this precipice of this like transition or this potential just like where things fall apart or the potential for like, you know, going to direct primary care more and people seeing value in that over everything else they're getting. Um, I think the awareness from the public of what insurance is truly offering and is gonna, it's gonna be more and more apparent. I don't think people are gonna say, except for the naive young ones who are just getting their first insurance policy or whatever. I think 
the general public is going to recognize the lack of value. Um, oh, we, we hope. We, we because hope. There, there is, there's, there's a need for, again, that domain specific knowledge. Yeah. There's a lot of people who are not physicians who spout stuff about healthcare mm -hmm. that don't know what they're talking about. Yeah. Because they don't have that, that knowledge in there. And that it, it's in, yeah, anyway. So I don't, I'm, I'm, I am very pessimistic. I'm probably more pessimistic than you. And this is not the, but the change position is supposed to be about, we're supposed to be optimistic, positive, but I am not at all optimistic for the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's why if it, it's up to me or friends and family members, I'm like, stay healthy. Yeah. You know, and that's why we talk about that stuff. Stay healthy, stay out of it. Yes, yeah. you absolutely need it. And then you dip your toe in there, you know, pretend it's like a raging river, get your little cup of water out of that raging river, but don't throw a bucket or jump in because it'll carry you downstream and bash you to hell and throw you over the waterfall onto the rocks and kill you. That's yeah. Especially if you want to be like the good patient and like do what you're told that those are the ones that worry about and you're not thinking at all about it and you're just kind of just going with it. Um, I would no. not say, go ahead. I was going to say, because I can see, I, I, the first person that came to mind was not that person at all. The first person I have is the, is the, the not so good pa person or not, the, not, not, not so good person, not so good patient. The one who doesn't trust like the initial thing of, Hey, we shouldn't do anything here. And then it's like, no, there's gotta be something wrong. And this person's a jerk because they didn't spend on two hours with me. And then they search and search and search and search. And they're going to find somebody who's going to tell them that they're sick. And they're going to do a bunch of crap. Try. And it, it, it is not even just a physician thing because there's a whole Oh yeah. Alternative environment out there. Yeah. Talk about extracting value. Holy crap. The stuff that they do. That's a whole nother episode. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the only thing I can say is that I think some people get pulled into it because they get the time to spend with those providers. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely. That, there it's, is it's, a value to that depending on what it is. However, it's a marketing thing. Yeah. It's a marketing yeah. thing. It's not you necessarily get a value there thing. too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, let, you know, I, I know we can go off in a lot of directions, but I would not say that I'm optimistic about the system that currently is existing per se. I think I'm optimistic that there are some people that third, 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 that have like no chance. They're just, they're always going to fall in the trap. There's that third that might eventually, you know, kind of like see the light. And then there's that third that's very like aware and very, um, <sighs> very involved with their not getting trapped. I'll definitely say there's some that just definitely will get trapped and they're just living their lives and they barely utilize. But then there's that middle section. I feel like they might have the opportunity if, you know, their neighbor went to direct primary care and they saw how inexpensive it was that they might realize, well, let me go just check it out. And then they start comparing and be like, well, I don't want this anymore. I'm just going to do this. Like, I, I'm optimistic about that there are some people that might see the light. I guess that's where I'm coming from. Because the pragmatic, practical thing is actually, I think, kind of pessimistic in a way because it is in a bad place, <laughs> if that makes sense. So um, I don't know if we, we haven't solved any uh, United States medical field problems, but I think- uh, Yeah, we haven't solved any problems other than the fact to say is, is um... I don't want to uh, hi hypocrites make me crazy. And when I'm a hypocrite, it drives me crazy. So it's not just, I'm not <laughs> calling everybody hypocrite. Yeah. Um, but really if you're in healthcare, then really do things because they're value driven, which should be based on evidence and not because you can do them. And if you are already making $500,000 a year or more, and you're pushing and pushing and pushing to do more, it, it is very, very hard in medicine to make over $500,000 a year without doing things that are not necessary. And I, I, will, I will put that fact out there Yeah. Uh, because you have to do, and the doing is about the, not the thing that we're supposed to do in medicine. Yeah. The only exception I might say to that is. Oh, cash, a, cash pay. A, well, that or a full-time exceptionally trained trauma surgeon that's in a you know, level one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're too, they're, too they're yeah. highly no, no. needed and yeah. <laughs> highly utilized because it's an emergency. Um, that's that's probably the only time I'd say that oh, God, they're God. worth their their money. <laughs> so, um, yeah. 
uh, there was something else I was going to finish off with. And you talked about bringing value. The last thing I'm going to say is when I think about my own practice and I look at others out there is that we had this moment where I thought I tried to see if I could get paid through insurance for some things that I do that I really don't get paid for per se. And the question is, are you still doing the thing that seems like the right thing to do despite getting paid or not? And if you're not getting paid, are you changing what you're doing because you're not getting paid for that? Even though it's the right thing to do, that's when you have to really check yourself. And so, um, are you adapting to find a way to do the things that are the right things to do, despite the fact that the financial incentives are there? Right. Like for, for you specifically, like in, cause you've done that by making videos that introduce important topics that need to be discussed before you have your anesthetic. Right. So, um, you know, ideally you would be, a, there'd be some sort of monetary incentive, like, but if you're not, you can still do it and then you're saving your time. Yeah. 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 So I'm still creating the, the pre-ops or consults before surgery but I've decreased the amount of time I have to spend in those because I created the video. So I modified just to be efficient, really, yeah. honestly. And yeah. it's a value for family members that weren't able to participate. And, you know, anyway, the point is, I think if you just put yourself in the, the patient's shoes, what makes the most sense for you if you were that patient? That's how I look at how I create my practice is what seems the most valuable, doesn't take up all of my time, and I still can create something different and better than what is out there. That's that's how I see creating value. And I think there's a lot of different ways that physicians, surgeons can do that. And I think you have to think it from the side of the from the side of the patient. Otherwise, you don't know what's valuable because you have to understand um, the patient. Well, and, and that's kind of the crux of the issue here. Treat every member that you see, every person that you see as if they were a loved one or family member give them the, if you love them, (laughs) well, well, I said loved one or or loved one, right? So give them the care that you would give to a, and then that's like the golden rule. Yeah. If that's, and if you adhere to that, you should be good. As long as you're not getting totally screwing yourself with the biases and said, Oh, I would do, you know, epidurals on all my family members all the time, blah, blah, blah. Um, but that, that's because there's also nothing worse than to hear of the stories of the people and who are the doers, but then to their friends, tell them to not do, have done what they do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Talk about hypocrisy. <laughs> Check yourself. <laughs> the neurosurgeon who had back pain and his neurosurgeon colleagues told him to not have a fusion mm-hmm. because they said you won't get better. Talk about hypocrisy when you're doing fusions. The uh, family member or the friend of someone who has, you know, a good network and strong connections in their community with back pain being told by their friend in the upper echelons of the community, don't have a fusion while they're doing fusions to everybody else. Mm -hmm. Talk about hypocrisy Mm -hmm. like that. If you're doing that, man, that's just plain evil in my book. Yeah. That's like, yeah, can't, there, I don't have an excuse. Stop for it. it. <laughs> Stop it. Don't tell, don't tell me you need to make your money. You're going to, you can do it again it, with a, if you finish medicine, medicine and you have a degree and you finished, you got a residency and you're board certified or even if you're not, there are ways that you can pay your bills. You don't do it by, by hurting people. Yeah. But, all right. I, I got to stop. Yeah. Well, I guess I'll take us out since, uh, you you've you've added so much to the conversation and uh, i think we both, we both stand for truth and value for those that we care for and uh, we hope that you listening do too and i think a lot of people do uh but uh sometimes changing and getting out of of your patterns uh can be uh, scary financially it can be um but at the same time uh, if your ethos is uh do the right thing um, don't harm, do no harm. Um, I think, uh, it's a good reminder to just check yourself and, uh, pretend that you are that patient and hopefully, um, you are that good person. Cause you'll probably just do the right thing. Um, so, uh, for those of you listening, if you don't know what the change physician is all about, you can go to thechangephysician.com and join the community there, whether you're a physician or physician ally, we'd love to see you there. Um, and until next time, 
please take care. Stay well, folks.